talking about education, training, and teamwork in order to improve neonatal resuscitation. Um, now, you might be wondering, what's an obstetrician talking about neonatal resuscitation? Why is an obstetrician talking about neonatal resuscitation? But when you think about it, the care of the neonate as it's born, the condition of the neonate as it's born, uh, has been very re reliant upon the care of the obstetrician and indeed the care of the midwife uh, up till that time. And you could even argue that the ultimate outcome for that a neonate um, relies perhaps more even on the obstetrician and the, neonatolo and, and the mid midwife than on the neonatologist. Now, the care of the baby at birth uh, requires a proper understanding about what happens during uh, transition. And the education about neonatal transition at birth uh, over the past 40 odd years has been extremely poor and quite inaccurate. Let's just have a look at what Ganong's medical physiology book says. At birth, the placental circulation is cut off and the peripheral resistance suddenly rises. Now, that is probably quite accurate <laughs> as what happens at most births, uh, really all over the world. But of course, it's not physiological. The reason the, cir the placental circulation is cut off is because somebody has applied a clamp to the cord. Um, but of course, it's not just uh, Ganon. All other ph physiology textbooks are virtually the same. Uh, and it extends right into pediatrics and cardiology. They all talk about the... Uh, the, the placental circulation ceasing at birth, either specifically stating uh, about a cord clamp or just implying that that cord clamp has, has been uh, put on. Um, the uh, latest edition of Ganong's medical physi physiology uh, has, in fact, that's the 25th uh, edition, has now... Uh, given, gives now uh, a, an accurate description of a transition, describing the continued placental circulation and the onset of uh, respiration. Um, but of course, that's only come out uh, about five years ago, and I'm sure uh, many of us have, have been educated long before that using these other textbooks. Let's just look to see what is happening. When the cord cl is clamped immediately after birth, when there's 40% of the combined cardiac output going out to the placenta, suddenly clamped off, that's got to go somewhere else. And of course, it shoots up into the baby's head and into its body. Um, so there's a sudden and dramatic rise in the neonatal blood pressure um, and, uh, and, and an inc and marked increase in the afterload of the heart. So the heart cannot sustain this uh, increase, uh, sustain, sustain its uh, output for uh, any particular length of time. And then, of course, You've got 40% of the uh, cardiac output going to the placenta. Therefore, 40% of the cardiac return is coming back from the placenta. That now is also immediately stopped. So the preload for the heart 
uh, is markedly reduced. Um, and of course, that means that the cardiac output will plummet. So first of all, there's a marked increase in the uh, blood pressure in the neonate, and then that's followed by a marked decrease in the uh, blood pressure of the neonate. Then there is the loss of this placental transfusion. Now, placental transfusion is really a misnomer because it's not a transfusion. Uh, the baby's getting its own blood. It's not even an autotransfusion because the blood, it's, the blood has never been out of its own circulation. Um, and indeed, what forms the placental transfusion, if you look at a single cell, it might be being, being transfused into the baby's circulation, uh, reaches the heart, and is pumped back out again through the umbilical arteries. So this blood that's been transfused is now being pump, pumped back out again. So it's not a transfusion. It's a redistribution of blood so that the large volume of blood that's in the, in the placenta is redistributed during transition into the neonate. If I put my hand up, then there's less, the venous blood tends to come down and there's less blood in my arm and slightly more blood in my body. I'm not giving myself a transfusion. And of course, this placental transfusion, the amount of blood that's uh, retained in the placenta during the, the circulation uh, is much greater or is increased if there's cord compression. Cord compression, of course, compresses the, uh, the, the, the umbilical vein much more than the umbilical artery because it's so much more compressible. So therefore, that increases the pressure um, in, the, in the placental venous system and results in a, a, larger number, um, a larger amount of blood in the placenta than it would have normally. And of course, if the cord is clamped immediately after birth, that uh, increased placental volume is uh, permanently uh, retained in the placenta and of course the the baby is now permanently uh, loses that amount of blood then there's the loss of oxygen um, and uh, this oxygen returning to the from the placenta is in fact quite important as I'll explain in a minute um, in addition of course there's the loss of the the stem cells which we know how important these stem cells are um, for, or, and potentially, of course, uh, they are of enormous importance, but they may well be of significant importance in every neonate. So it's often taught, of course, <coughs> that um, there won't be any blood, any oxygen in the blood returning from the placenta, but that's not true at all. Um, of course, the placental circulation does cease naturally after a few minutes, um, stopped by vasospasm. Um, but until that has occurred, there is in fact a significant oxygen content in the blood returning from the placenta. Um, 3.7 to 7, 3 .7 uh, kilopascals. Now, that's a little bit less than the baby's uh, been used to in the previous few months in utero. Um, and of course, it's a lot less than we are used to um, as adults. But uh, in fact, from the Codwell Extreme Everest expedition, it was found that um, a, a healthy man at the top of Everest can have an arterial oxygen content of 2.5 kilopascals. So a lot less than 3.7 and still be perfectly uh, healthy and um, conscious and moving up, moving up on up the mountain. 
Um, previously, uh, it was thought that um, much anything under three uh, could, wasn't compatible with uh, a brain function. And of course, you can imagine just how brave these men were. Uh, they actually had a, a, a femoral puncture um, carried out close to the top of Everest, and then someone uh, took the blood down to the next uh, camp where they had set up all the uh, apparatus to do the blood analysis. Um, I, th I don't think I'd be prepared to do that, even if I had the ability to climb Everest. Now, this distorted view of uh, cord clamping has an effect on research conclusions. I mean, in reality, it's um, early cord clamping, or indeed any cord clamping, can be considered uh, as the intervention. Perhaps it's uh, not unreasonable, once the circulation has ceased, um, uh, that uh, clamping and cutting the cord is simply cutting and clamping um, uh, uh, a bit of tissue that's lost its function, that is no, no longer needed. But certainly, early cord clamping is the inter intervention. But of course, delayed cord clamping in uh, research is usually considered the intervention because it's, it was, at least, unusual. And this has an effect on the, the conclusions because if there's no significant difference in the outcome between uh, one side where there's delayed cord clamping and the other uh, set where there's uh, uh, immediate clamping, then the conclusion is that delay, there's no need to change. Delayed cord clamping doesn't have any uh, benefit effect. But of course, the correct conclusion, if you are using, uh, understanding that early cord clamping is the intervention, then you can now say early cord clamping has no advantage and therefore it should be stopped. Of course, the reality is that uh, nearly all studies have shown that early cord clamping is harmful. Er and early cord clamping results in iron deficiency and anemia. But the uh, research papers, of course, report it saying that delayed cord clamping leads to a higher hemoglobin and higher iron stores. And while this is true, it distorts the, the reality. And this irrational thought process um, affects other aspects of our care. Um, first of all, we often hear that the, you know, you d if you delay cord clamping too long, the baby can get too much blood. Well, of course, that's nonsense because the amount of blood in the placenta and the placental circulation is limited. So even if there was no blood left in the placenta, it still wouldn't actually get too much blood. Usually after uh, delayed cord clamping and if we wait for white, we wait for a physiological closure of the, uh, <coughs> the placental circulation, uh, there will only be about 20 mils uh, left in the, the placenta itself. Um, so there's no concern that uh, delayed cord clamping can lead to too much blood, i.e. polycythemia. Of course, polycythemia does occur sometimes, um, but it occurs for other reasons. And sometimes, of course, you can even get a a maternal fetal hemorrhage that leads to uh, a polycythemia in the, in the neonate. Um, now for controlled cord traction, uh, which is part of active management, the woman really needs to be on her back. 
But this is probably not physiological. Um, and it probably can be quite harmful. There's no evidence that the timing of the oxytocic uh, affects the risk of uh, postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, and we did this systematic review, a Cochrane data, a systematic review, and showed that the, ev the evidence is that no matter when you give the uh, oxytocic, it can be effective in reducing the risk of postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, and indeed, if you wait until after the placenta is delivered, um, it is just as effective as at any other time. So no need to th be thinking that the oxytocic has got to be given with the anterior shoulder or whatever else we were taught because that uh, wasn't based on any evidence at all. Uh, and in fact, <laughs> there are other things. Even the evidence for um, clamping and uh, initiating cord control cord traction at five minutes, as uh, suggested by the Cochrane Review, is not based on any uh, true evidence. Skin to skin. Now, I've been looking at the history of, of uh, natural births or births in uh, primitive societies and what women would do naturally. Um, and it seems that in, in history, the birth would normally occur with the woman in a squatting position or possibly kneeling. Um, when, when the baby's actually being born. Um, she would then sit down and hold the baby on her thighs and abdomen uh, before, while the placenta was uh, delivering. And of course, this would be some uh, considerable time, usually five, 10 minutes, certainly for delayed cord clamping to occur. Um, and she'd hold the baby skin to skin, on her thighs, close to her breasts, uh, quite possibly uh, the, the baby would in fact start to suckle um, and certainly smell the, 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 uh, the breasts. And um, it's only since obstetricians um, and possibly midwives uh, started having a bigger role um, and I, I understand it was one of the French kings that initiated the idea of women lying on their back um, so because then we could see uh, the delivery of the baby. If the woman's squatting, um, then the actual delivery of the baby I isn't uh, all that visible. Um, and indeed, I've, I've found myself... Um, working in some areas where it w the women wanted to deliver uh, squatting or uh, semi-standing up. Um, and I found that uncomfortable because I wasn't able to determine exactly what was happening. But of course, uh, I really shouldn't have been uh, concerning myself. Um, and of course, if the, baby, if the mother delivers uh, naturally, i.e. has a spontaneous birth and there's no attendant and sh then she is going to bring the baby up just onto her, uh, onto her thighs. She's not going to take it right up onto her, her chest. Um, she's going to keep it skin to skin on her thighs. There's no doubt, of course, that skin to skin uh, is a natural process which has considerable benefits. Uh, improved breastfeeding, um, better thermal control, less hypothermia in the baby, and of course uh, a, a general maternal satisfaction. But skin to skin must be exactly what we're saying. It must be the baby's skin against the mother's skin. The baby can't be wrapped up in a towel and placed on the mother's abdomen 
and call that skin to skin. Um, so when we are often doing what we think is the best thing, wrapping, wrapping the baby up, drying it, uh, placing it on the mother's abdomen, we're not doing skin to skin. And I think that's uh, a very important point. Uh, of course, you can do uh, get the baby skin to skin on the mother's abdomen, but the baby should be dried, uh, placed on the, on the mother's abdomen, and of course the mother can't be wearing a, a, a gown or anything. So it's got to be genuine skin to skin and then covered uh, with the towel uh, to keep it warm and probably ideally a hat. Um, now, ab on the uh, mother's abdomen, if she's lying prone, then of course this now puts the, the baby above the placenta, maybe only 10 centimeters, uh, and whether or not that has a, an influence or not, I'll try and uh, explain shortly. Um, so, now this is Jeffrey, Do Jeffrey Dawes um, from the 1940s and 50s, uh, a very celebrated English physiologist, uh, considered to be <coughs> the foremost international authority on fetal and neonatal physiology, um, working in London. And uh, he said that lifting a baby high up is not physiological and can lead to neonatal hypervolemia. Um, <coughs> Here's a, a TV birth, um, one of the first TV births uh, shown. Um, and uh, here you can see the, the obstetrician holding the baby up um, and the cord, of course, was intact. Uh, the baby's obviously quite uh, healthy uh, with very good tone with its, um, and starting to cry. It's uh, hand up, I think, um, but, and of course the intention of the obstetrician was very good, and indeed, so I often did that as well, as I was taught. You're holding up, letting the mum see her baby, but of course you are also holding that baby up high, just exactly what Jeffrey Dawes said, do not do, because that can lead to neonatal hypervolemia. And of course, in this TV birth, we actually saw the baby afterwards and it suddenly went very quiet. Um, and it was certainly uh, about five or 10 minutes before they were able to take the baby over to its, uh, its mother. Now, regarding the height of the, the baby above the placenta, during the uh, transition, uh, it's actually simple physics. Um, which, which Jeffrey Dawes, of course, was explaining. It's because of the, the capacitance vessels in the placenta and, to a certain extent, the umbilical, the, the umbilical vein. Um, you can see here at the bottom, this is the placenta, uh, and this is the situation, say, uh, in utero. Um, the, the, this is the, the, the capacitance vessel, and of course there's no increased capacity in the uh, umbilical arteries, uh, sort of semi-solid vessel. But you elevate it, and what happens is these capacitance vessels, because there's a reduced, uh, well, in fact, it's a negative pressure uh, re um <coughs> gradient there. These fill up until the pressure gradient has uh, become uh, positive again. Uh, I mean, it doesn't show it maybe terribly dramatic there, but I mean, a small amount of blood can make a big difference. So it's very important that uh, the baby is not raised too much uh, above the placenta. And indeed, 
Uh, what this will do is it will slow down the rate of uh, blood being redistributed from the placenta uh, part of the circulation into the rest of the baby. So this increased volume of blood in the capacitance vessels uh, results in a reduced cardiac return um, and therefore reduced preload to the heart. Uh, but of course, the, the heart's still able to pump the blood out, so the, uh, the, the blood doesn't, uh, output doesn't uh, decrease. And the effect will be largely related to proportional to the height of the, uh, the neonate above the placenta. Um, so that 10 centimetres might not make much difference, uh, but it, uh, it may well uh, be critical, of course, in, in some uh, neonates. Um, an oxytocic might help a little bit because it will increase the intrauterine pressure and uh, reduce the capacitance of these uh, placental vessels. What about the clinical studies? Well, of course, the clinical studies haven't actually shown any difference in the volume of the placental transfusion when the baby's uh, on the mother's abdomen uh, when she's supine, i.e. about five or ten centimetres above the placenta. But, of course, that doesn't mean to say that there may not be a small reduction in the size of the placental transfusion. And that uh, may only have a minor effect in the vast majority of babies. Uh, but just for some, for the odd baby, it may well be uh, critical. What about when the neonates um, at or below the level of the placenta? Well, of course, um, there will be a reversal of this gradient, so there'll be an increased rate of return um, of blood from the placenta to the neonate. Um, the umbilical uh, arteries may have a minor reduction in output, but it's going to be very minor, uh, and that needn't be of any consequence in any case. Uh, and then there'll be an increased flow. And of course, this may well be of particular importance when there's been cord compression, because now there's a more rapid return. You're essentially sort of not just reversing the cord compression, you're reversing the effect of the cord compression. And so there's a, rapid, a more rapid increase of uh, blood coming back from the uh, placenta, placental part of the circulation. And as I said before, you can't have um, too much, a too high a placental transfusion. The, so the volume of blood coming back when the, when the baby's uh, below the level of the placenta will still be the same. It will just come back a little bit quicker. And what do we get taught in 10 teachers? Um, I'm not sure whether that's still used as a textbook or not. Probably mainly undergraduates, but uh, it is still it's one one uh, that probably influenced many uh, of the current generation. Um, and the author here is talking about um, the baby, the failure of the baby to respond to resuscitation. As we know, most babies, when they're born, if they're apneic, a few uh, rescue breaths and it will uh, start to breathe fairly quickly. Um, but there are some babies who uh, perhaps are so depressed that they need a considerable time and amount of ventilation. So what <coughs> do you do if a baby doesn't respond and here the author is saying, uh, consider giving uncrossed match O negative blood if the baby looks pale because massive fetal maternal hemorrhage, blood loss at delivery 
or failure of an adequate placental transfusion due to extreme cord compression can be a reason for birth depression. Right. First of all, can I just ask you, <laughs> how many of you have uh, O negative uh, blood available in your labor ward? Right, everybody. Um, and it's in the fridge? So how long would it take to get that blood in, transfused into the baby? Well, uh, uh, it's a hypothetical question I'm really asking you, but obviously it's going to be, I think, five minutes at the very shortest, uh, quite possibly 10 minutes. It's going to be cold, or if it's warmed up, it's, you've got a, an unusually effective uh, warmer. But it's been caused, it could have been caused by extreme cord compression. Now, perhaps the extreme cord compression is the cord clamp. Um, and the whole situation could have been avoided by not having extreme cord compression, by not applying the cord clamp and allowing that blood to return to the baby. Uh, its own blood, it would be warm blood, and of course it would occur a lot, lot quicker than you could ever get an emergency transfusion of uncrossed match blood. Um, just a little bit of sort of lay information we're getting from the baby center here about an emergency home birth. Um, and here's what it's saying. Uh, if, if you're having a, a, an emergency home birth and you've no, no help, no midwife or, or anybody else to help you, um, they say, when the baby is born, check if there's a loop of cord around its neck. Now, I can't imagine how <laughs> a woman could ever do that if, she, if she'd never <laughs> had a baby before or, or knew anything about it. But of course, this is one of the, the situation, one of the things that's, that midwives and obstetricians have been taught uh, again for the last uh, 40, 50 years is to feel for a nuchal cord, which is probably the worst thing you can do because uh, a nuchal cord uh, is of no consequence in, at the, in this situation. Um, and uh, as I say, she couldn't, but she couldn't possibly feel for it. But then what do they say? Uh, if the cord's too short or tight, leave it alone and don't pull on it. Uh, <laughs> then you can deal with it after your baby is born. So therefore, in fact, that's really what we should be doing. <laughs> we just deal with it after the baby is born. But of course, there's the, the concern that uh, the cord length may limit the descent of the baby. Again, very rarely is that actually going to be a problem. Um, but if it is, there is the somersault maneuver, um, where essentially the baby's head is held against the, uh, the mother's perineum, uh, held flexed, against the mother's perineum, and the baby flexes its body. She pushes to push, flexes its body, and it comes out. The head remains close to the perineum uh, with the cord around its neck, and then, of course, it can be, can be untangled. No, 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 I'm no, oh, well, I'm, I'm not, well, no, we didn't. <laughs> We didn't suggest, in fact, <laughs> that, uh, that, that on the baby center that we should be using the, the uh, somersault maneuver. But in fact, she probably would uh, because, in fact, the most effective way of doing this uh, somersault maneuver is to have the woman um, erect and, and squatting. Uh, then she's got the advantage of pushing and also the advantage of gravity. Whereas, of course, on her back, you can, I mean, this, this uh, picture, in fact, shows 
that she's on her back, but if I turned it round, <laughs> it would essentially be her uh, in an erect position. Um, and uh, so it, it is a, just a matter of the woman uh, pushing hard enough, holding, and the, the midwife uh, or obstetrician holding the baby's head flexed and close to the, um, the mother's uh, perineum. Um, and uh, can I ask again, how many of you uh, were, were taught about the somersault manoeuvre? How ah, you were taught about it. How many, uh, well, knew about it? And how many have done it? Right. Um, but I think it's exceptional. Uh, most uh, obs obstetricians and indeed midwives uh, do not know about the, um, <coughs> the somersault manoeuvre. Now, um, we're talking about the effects of early cord clamping in the neonate that hasn't started to breathe. So this is the potential where uh, we have uh, the, the need for resuscitation, which generally is just ventilation. Um, the baby's not breathing, the cord is clamped, and here there's a shock to the system. Um, in fact, it probably should go up and then down. Um, but a marked shock to the system, which it recovers once it starts to breathe. Whereas if the baby's already got established uh, breathing, then cord clamping has little or no effect, uh, depending on how long you're waiting. Uh, and this comes from the Leiden group um, of uh, neonatologists who have developed the Concord neonatal. So they are quite clearly showing um, that this is very important to avoid this shock on the neonate. What do NICE and the ILCOR guidelines um, state? They are advising avoiding cord clamping uh, for at least one minute. Now, sorry for <laughs> asking uh, the audience questions all the time but it does keep you awake. Um, are you all following NICE guidelines? Well, uh, yeah, I think it's at least a minute, so therefore it's, uh, still, you're still within the NICE guideline as long as you wait at, uh, at least a minute. Right, and of course the, the Earl Core guidelines are also um, advising delayed clamping for at least a minute. Uh, ILCOR, of course, also have other recommendations, like, for example, they say that the baby, after it's born, should be in an optimal position to facilitate an open airway. Um, there also needs to be measures to prevent hypothermia. They also state because the, the, it's the heart rate that determines um, to some extent the condition of the baby, assessment of the baby, there must be a uh, heart rate measured and documented. Now, this might be <coughs> uh, not too difficult to achieve at a normal birth. Um, are you all achieving this, do you think, uh, these three criteria at a normal birth during that one minute or that one, at least one minute of delayed cord clamping. 
But are you able to achieve that at uh, caesarean section without risking breaching the uh, sterile area? So what do you need? So for the baby to be in an optimal position to facilitate an open airway, this is how they show it. Uh, the newborn head should be in a neutral position. Uh, and generally that requires a flat surface um, to get that neck position uh, correct. Um, and of course, if the baby is very floppy, then uh, it's going to be rather harder for it to achieve a neutral position. Um, mother's abdomen or mother's chest, is that actually uh, a suitable platform to achieve this? Um, I think it's questionable. Um, although, of course, there are other reasons why the mother's abdomen and chest could be ideal. Um, and then, of course, what, what is your, your thermal care for that baby uh, in these positions and during this one minute. Um, and of course, if we are going to be talking about resuscitation, then there needs to be uh, uh, possibly a suitable platform uh, for it. Now we're talking about uh, planning, really, um, and coordination and teamwork. And here, this is the team that have just completed the NEP Chord 3 study uh, in Nepal. And this was a study where they were uh, dividing <coughs> babies who were uh, as, uh, asphyxiated or apneic, apneic at birth into either those that got delayed cord clamping and ventilation or uh, delayed cord uh, or immediate cord clamping and uh, resuscitation uh, under a, a standard. And you'll see that, um, well, it, it requires teamwork, it required working carefully out exactly what they had to do. And of course, as part of a study, uh, that was particularly important. So um, they, they were all normal births, uh, nurse midwives trained according to the Helping Babies Breathe program uh, algorithm. Uh, although, of course, in the Helping Babies Breathe program, they don't uh, have uh, intact cord um, mother side resuscitation. Um, and they, they uh, randomized into either early cord clamping, which was defined as under 60 seconds, or delayed cord clamping, which was defined as more than three minutes. And they would uh, ventilate during that time. Ventilation was simply with a, an ambu bag and mask. Um, and what and they, they also carefully monitored the condition of the of the neonate. And what did they find? Well, that the oxygen saturation at one minute, five minutes, and ten minutes was higher in the babies that had an intact cord. The heart rate at one and five minutes was lower, um, but that's maybe uh, represents a less sudden reactive tachycardia. Um, at GAR, were higher at one, five, and 10 minutes. Uh, and of course, they also, which would be reflected in the APGAR, they also had uh, earlier first breaths and crying, spontaneous first breaths and crying. And then uh, significantly, no difference in the baby's temperatures or their bilirubin at discharge. So apparently, no downside at all. Um, to uh, mother side or uh, mother side neonatal resuscitation with an intact cord. 
What does it require to be able to achieve this, though? Um, first of all, there needs to be conviction. And the team uh, in Nepal and elsewhere, they, they are all convinced that, delayed, that early cord clamping is an intervention uh, with no proven advantage and that uh, there's plenty of evidence that it's actually harmful and is likely to be harmful in the baby that re uh, requires uh, resuscitation. So it requires cooperation, teamwork, innovation, and evolution of equipment. Uh, and that's where I got interested uh, in this about uh, 10 years ago. Preparation and practice so that the team needs to be prepared and practice their uh, procedures so that when it, the need comes, they can immediately proceed. This is uh, the ILCOR algorithm for just any resuscitation. Now, of course, when the baby's vigorous, uh, then there's no problem, obviously. Uh, but wh maybe when they're a li little bit in the middle here, this is the sort of situation where you keep the cord intact they're likely to start breathing on, the, on their own. Whereas if you've clamped the cord, it's quite possible that they will um, not start breathing. Uh, and then there's the baby that's clearly uh, requiring resuscitation. What are the measures? Well, uh, I'm sure you're, you know, know them all. Obviously, ambient temperature is very important. Um, and this is particularly important in the operating theater where a cesarean section is being carried out. Get the cap on the baby's head, warm towels, skin to skin, as I've mentioned. Uh, it's possible to have an over radiant heater and other sources, of course, of uh, heat, such as a chemical bag. Uh, and it's the same for the pre premature baby, apart from, of course, that the ambient temperature is probably even more important and they need to be placed in a uh, poly bag. Uh, what, what do you do for the uh, ventilation? Well, of course, uh, an ambu bag and mask is probably ideal uh, in a low risk situation. And I think every midwife should have immediate access to an ambu bag and mask so that uh, she can keep the cord intact. Uh, peep with a T piece, of course, if you're a, a neonatologist and they may need air warming and humidifiers. Um, and this shows uh, Patrick Van Rienen. I think uh, showing how it can be, the baby can be resuscitated uh, at underneath the mo mother's legs. But I'd like to see the mother actually being s sitting up a lot more. Um, and uh, well, I in New Zealand, I found uh, they were actually able to uh, bring a resuscitator close up at cesarean section um, and use the, uh, the suction and positive pressure ventilation from the resuscitator via some sterile tubing to initiate mother side resuscitation at cesarean section. Um, and then in Darlington, we were able to show that that was again possible with a, a, a GE resuscitator. They, they can all be used in fact, uh, for this, but it's not ideal. Um, so this is, this is the Concord neonatal uh, website. L look what they're claiming, um, that it's going to have a, a, a dramatic change in the uh, condition of the neonate. This is how we, we evolved from a, a simple bed trolley. Um, then in the uh, 80s, Alan and Gadi used this in a preterm study of uh, delayed cord clamping. We took that uh, into a, a next stage, called it the basics trolley, bedside assessment, stability, and uh, immediate cardiorespiratory support. Um, and we got the, the Innovations Award in 2010 and then took this on to what is commercially available now as the Life Start trolley uh, designed by Nick Bettle.
This, these are the claims for this approach. Reduced com complications at birth, sepsis, intraventricular hemorrhage, and necrotizing enterocolitis. That's for the preterm babies. Uh, improved survival for both. Uh, lo less lo long-term disability and uh, the cost of care, of course, which can be enormous when you uh, consider the care of cerebral palsy. Um, so I'm not going to worry too much about that because sometimes it, it takes a few people. But uh, if you've got two or three, uh, you can certainly get them around a, a live start trolley. Once you get up to four, maybe not quite so easy. And then monitoring, of course, is very important. But that can all be incorporated into these, uh, these trolleys just in exactly the same way. Length of the cord is rarely a problem. Um, so it needs teamwork, and you need to work out how to achieve this at normal birth, cesarean birth, and assisted vaginal birth. The role of each member of the team needs to be completely understood and they need to arrive and position and, plat and uh, position the platform immediately without uh, discussion. Uh, and uh, Anup Kateria in uh, San Diego has done a, a bit of work on uh, how to uh, organize the team. Um, he's got here for both at cesarean section and uh, vaginal birth. And there's now, of course, other interests. This is the live start, the first. And then we got this system in, uh, in the USA, event first, got all the equipment, but you need to provide the, the platform. And then the most recent one is the Concord trolley developed in Leiden. Thank you very much uh, for your attention.